Welcome to your population ecology notes. Now, ecology is organized into different levels. At the simplest level, we have individual organisms like you or me and how they interact with their environment. Today, we're going to look at populations, which are groups of individuals that are living together. Last class, we looked at communities, which are interacting populations. So you looked at producers and consumers and you know, how organisms, how one population might eat another population or compete with another population. Now we take a, a community and we look not only at the living things but also the non-living things, the abiotic things like water and temperature. Then we get an ecosystem. So an ecosystem is a combination of the living and non-living things in an area. And if we look at all the ecosystems on Earth together, that's the biosphere. And we know that things like weather can be affected by factors that are not very nearby. The whole Earth together is one giant interacting ecosystem. But let's look at populations. So you guys know this from before. We talked about um, populations when we were talking about evolution. But it's a group of individuals of the same species in the same area. The area can be a small area, like say the San Francisco Bay, or it can be a large area, like the state of California. And when we're talking about population ecology, we want to know what factors can affect that population, can make that population bigger, can make that population smaller. So there's many non-living factors that can affect that, and that includes things like temperature, water, nutrients, um, more unusual things like asteroids hitting the Earth, or volcanoes. So these are non-living factors that can make a population bigger or smaller. There's also living things that can make a population bigger or smaller. And this includes a lot of what you guys looked at before in interactions between species. So food, competition, predators, and diseases. Now diseases are not always caused by living things, but they often are. So disease could actually technically fit into both categories. All of those things, though, that we just looked at can really be grouped into two bigger categories. The only way a population can get bigger is, one, if new individuals are born. Now, how often they're born can depend on genetics, birth rate, but also can depend on resources. If you have more food, then you'll have more offspring, they'll survive better. So birth can be affected by outside factors. And also immigration. Because remember, when we're looking at a population, we're looking at things in a certain area. So if new organisms of the same species arrive from outside the area, then that's immigration with an I. Conversely, there's only really two ways to remove individuals from the population. Now the first one, of course, the opposite of birth, which is death. And again, as you guys probably have seen a thousand ways to die, there are many ways to die. So this can be through predators, through disease, through not having enough food, many ways to die, but in the end, death is one of the only ways you can remove individuals from a population. But of course, there's also the opposite of immigration, which is emigration with an E, which is when species leave an area or individuals leave an area. So immigration and emigration always kind of go together. For instance, if I move to Australia, I would be emigrating with an E from the United States, but I would be immigrating from Australia's point of view. So when someone emigrates from one place, they immigrate to the next place. One way to remember the difference between immigration and emigration, immigration starts with an I, like in, and emigration starts with an E, like exit. So immigration in, emigration exit. Now the balance of these factors of adding and removing individuals um, determines the population growth of an area. So for example, some countries have are growing in population, like India or the United States, and that's because there's more birth and immigration than there is death and emigration. But the other countries have a relatively stable population, like say Japan. That means that they have a balance of birth and immigration in their death and emigration. It doesn't mean no one's being born and no one's dying, it just means that they about equal out. Now the earth as a whole there's no immigration or emigration from the Earth because no one's moving to other planets. But the birth and death rates determine the growth of the planet as a whole. As it happens, we have a lot more birth than death right now, and so the population of the planet is growing. And we're actually going to look at that in more detail later. 
Now when a population grows really quickly, we call that exponential growth. And we saw this back when the bunnies were taking over the world when we looked at evolution. Now, back when the bunnies took over the world, we talked about how that's something that generally doesn't happen because usually there's limiting factors. There's limited resources, there's competition, there's predators that would keep an, you know, an individual species or an individual population from growing so quickly. But occasionally there's unusual circumstances where this can happen. One is when you introduce an organism to a new environment, and we're going to look at that a little bit more later. And another one is when there's a catastrophe, like maybe a fire or maybe something like overhunting, where a population is lowered a whole lot and then is able to bounce back. So here's a couple examples of species that were um, almost extinct and then they were protected and able to come back. And you can see that they show a very steep line, which is exponential growth rate. Now, even when we do have temporary exponential growth, it can't go on forever because eventually something will run out, food or space or something. So exponential growth is not sustainable. Eventually when you hit that limit, the limit, the amount of species, the amount of individuals that an area can support is called the carrying capacity. So here's a graph of fur seals. Now, fur seals were overhunted in the 1800s. Fur was a big thing back then. It became less of a thing, and the seals were also protected, but fur just kind of went out of style, too. Um, so you can see the population grew exponentially at first, but eventually the seals didn't have enough resources to support a bigger population, and it leveled off at about 10,000 seals. Sometimes we see a slightly different pattern with species that reproduce quickly, where they grow exponentially, but because they're reproducing very quickly, they actually go past their carrying capacity. So there will be a generation that they reproduce so quickly that they run out of food and there's a die-off before they hit their carrying capacity. So you can see here um, that these little um, what it, clad cladocerans grew very quickly and actually passed their carrying capacity. So many of them died before they stabilized around the carrying capacity. There are some species that don't really reach a stable carrying capacity, and these are species that have a very close relationship with each other. Um, often it's a predator-prey relationship. And you can see that this, these two particular ones, now this is a lynx and a hare, the lynx and the hare have an interesting relationship because the hare is the primary food of the lynx and the hare's basically main predator is the lynx. So their populations affect each other and we end up with this cycling population. So what happens is you have a lot of hares, they reproduce very quickly, and because the lynx has a lot of food, the lynx then reproduces more quickly. But then the, because there's a lot of lynxes, they eat more hares, which lowers the hare population which means there's not enough food, so in the next generation the lynx has fewer offspring, and then that population goes down. But then because there's fewer lynxes, the hare population goes back up, and on and on and so forth. So they cycle together. So in this case, we can't actually pinpoint a carrying capacity because it's cycling. I guess maybe you could average it to say the carrying capacity. Also notice that because the hare is lower on the food web, there's always going to be more hares than lynxes. We talked about last class that energy conversion is not perfect. Only about 10% of the energy at each level of the food chain moves on. So you're always going to have more hares than lynxes or else the lynxes wouldn't be able to survive at all. Now I said we were going to talk more about humans. And here's a graph of human population growth up until about 2000. And I'll be showing you another graph in a moment. This is not the one you're going to draw in your notes. Um, this graph shows that human population growth has been exponential. So think about some of the factors that have contributed to that. Now, I'll let you think about that. Okay. You can also see that there's a little dip in the population where that line is, and that is the Black, the black Plague, when a huge chunk of the world's population died off. But after that, we had many advances that helped human population grow. The Industrial Revolution gave us technology that helped improve our health, that helped improve food storage and food transport. 
Then, of course, we had medical advances that helped us cure many diseases that used to kill people off. Um, something that I don't have written on here but was also important was the Green Revolution in the 1900s that helped us be able to produce enough food for everybody. So all these things led to the exponential growth of humans. In 2005, we had 6 billion people. In 2012, we hit 7 billion, which means now we're 7 billion and counting, and we're growing at about 200,000 people per day. Now this makes us wonder, are we reaching carrying capacity? And some people worry that we're going to be like that graph we looked at before, where we might accidentally pass carrying capacity and then have, you know, starvation and people dying off. Um, you know, this is a possibility, although sometimes people get a little overly worked up about it. But the United Nations looked at this and came up with some projections about the possibilities for human population growth in the next hundred years or so. Now you can see here that the blue line is the most recent population growth and that's where we have really accurate numbers and it's heading straight up at the moment. So in a worst case scenario we keep heading up at the same rate and you know we'll reach 16, uh, 16 billion people in the world. That's a lot of people. It might not work out so well. Um, many scientists now have noticed that just in the last year, population growth has slowed down a bit, and they think we're actually starting to stabilize and will soon reach our carrying capacity and end up with about 10 billion people, and that will be the stable population of Earth. Now that remains to be seen, but that's what a lot of scientists are thinking right now, and that's the yellow line, the sort of median projection. Now, if birth rates drop a lot more than we currently expect, the sort of best case scenario, the population of the Earth actually might go down a little bit, which environmentally speaking would actually probably be helpful because fewer people on Earth. Now we wouldn't want people to just die, but that would be because of a lower birth rate. Um, I know you guys have talked about in your other classes that one of the things that contributes to a lower birth rate is improved education for women around the world because well-educated women tend to have fewer kids. So if we improve education for women around the world, especially in developing countries, we might be able to lower the birth rate enough to reverse a little bit of our population growth.